Stop that. Stop that. Stop that. Uh, yeah, yeah. Out of here, I'm chatting to the noise. Move too quick, can't stop for the talking. Out of here, I'm chatting with the noise. Just too sharp with the prize. White girls better tell me I'm awesome, yeah. Hot like fire on the pond. If you want to touch my please use caution. Cold like zero degree. I'm out the cage, gotta let out the beast. Revolutionary guy, let out the streets. Locked in a cage, I'ma let out the, let out the, let out the, let out the, let out the sheets. We came from one man, forget my peace. We take the west side, take on the east. I'ma put him in the cage, never let out the, let out the, let out the, let out the. I hear him chat to the noise, move too quick, can't stop for the talking. I hear him chat with the boys, man so tough, but man's keep walking, yeah. Just too sharp with the prize, white girls better tell me I'm awesome, yeah. Hot like fire on the pine, if you wanna touch my feet. Stop that. Stop that. Stop that. Right after the Super Bowl, Stugatz. Mm -hmm. Immediately at the end of football. Right. With impeccable, perfect timing. LeBron James <laughs> enters the mix. LeBron James He's back. LeBron James enters the conversation before the NBA All Star team. He is not on one of the best teams, but in a sport for the last 15 years, he has dominated, and the storylines are everywhere in that sport. For him at the end to be this old and still be in the game about the Warriors or having owner to owner conversations about whether or not LeBron James wants to shift the balance of the league by playing with Steph Curry at the end and creating whatever that story is. What's going on back there with you guys? You seem to be uh... a lot of questions back here on when was the all-star trade deadline or was it before the all-star break or not? The NBA trade, the deadline. NBA we trying to trade deadline. The thing is I told yes. everybody back here, it was in Vegas. We just didn't see it because of all the thousand things we were doing in Vegas. But I remember walking by a TV at the sports book and being like, huh, the Knicks made a trade. Yeah, apparently, huh? apparently the trade deadline is now before the all-star game, which I understand why, because it can be really awkward if you get traded, you know, around there. But uh, all these stories about LeBron, they're interesting, but they're much ado about nothing since it's not an actual power play. The, the day has come and gone. Uh, correct, but it's still him trying to get in the conversation, is it not? It's, it's him. Uh, is there a lack of LeBron conversation? I mean, LeBron's in the conversation still. It's Golden State trying to win another championship. That's what, And LeBron's saying, no, I don't want to win a championship there. It's weird. Do you find interesting what is happening with the Warriors at the end of this dynastic run where Clay Thompson is talking to you out loud about his vulnerabilities and Jerkish and Draymond Green are going back and forth? And basically, the clash in the middle of the Warriors with Draymond Green is do you mock him for doing therapy? Do you like that's actually a, that's that is now where the mental health conversation has gone in the NBA where trash talk resides. Draymond and Charles Barkley are going to be doing a simulcast of the All Star game together. Draymond is, is creating his media career right now. It's going to be a flourishing, wonderful mess. He's going to be willing to trash people. He'll go for four minutes on Jerkic, but Jerkic hits him with, Don't stay too long on your podcast. You don't want to be late for therapy. You doing a Chris Cody thing where you combine the first letter of the first name and then the last name? Or you got something else on your mind on Valentine's, hey, Bubba? Huh. Jessica, I am soothed by seeing you back there because you have emerged from the Vegas airport still loud talking for three days. What do you mean? You don't, uh, you don't remember the conversation that you had with Greg Cody that was drunker than Greg Cody's conversation? I asked Tony if he was here on Monday, like five oh, like we sat next ago. to. Like, like, I think she. I, I think. So I, think I, I think she is drunk the way Jason Kelsey was drunk in that airport. He's not going to shake that off for four days. Yeah, that's pretty accurate. I saw a picture of Jason Kelsey in the airport, like just with his head down, wearing a cardigan mm. in the bright fluorescent lights at, at baggage claim, and I was like, yeah, I, I, that's how I felt for like four days now. I, in no amount of sleep has has healed me. That flight hurts, huh? The, all 
all about that flight hurts through that airport after. If you spend six, seven, four days in Vegas, oh, that flight hurts. That city hurts. The flight hurts. All of it hurts. It I doesn't mean. help either that my mom, like who I barely ever talk to because she doesn't know how to use a phone, told me yesterday on the phone, I looked really tired on Monday. Oh, <laughs> Thanks, <wow>. Mom. <laughs> Come on. Oh, no. You bounce back well, but you don't remember parts of your s- Sunday or Monday. Like the when, when I was told that you were drunker than Greg Cody, Jessica, it's not something I can fathom. I haven't seen on a spectrum of drunkenness <laughs> drunker than Greg Cody. Yeah, neither have I. <laughs> you don't recall it? I have no idea what we talked about, Dan. I, I have no idea. All I know is Monday we were talking on the show about me giving my eyelashes to Lewis, and then Lee sent mm-hmm. me a picture of my room key from Circa <laughs> with a pair of dried contacts and eyelashes stuck to it. Oh. You had a week. I mean, You had a week? I had a day. I, I was just one day. I can't imagine oh, yeah. being there for – oh, wait, we were there for six days. <laughs> well, uh, an, an argument broke out before the show today, Stugatz, because uh, Mike Ryan has retired and for two days is now returning in a new role, hmm. uh, but hasn't gotten to talk about the Super Bowl publicly. And Jessica was uh, still loud talking from drunk Las Vegas airport about uh, about how much news came out of the press conference where Shanahan is explaining how he coughed up the Super Bowl. <laughs> coughed up the Super Bowl with decision making and nobody wants to think about it. So Mike and Jessica, you haven't gotten a chance to talk about the Super Bowl. What are your remnants of Super Bowl observations that we haven't had time to heat around here what's a worse look for kyle shanahan to double down and try to apply logic kind of reverse engineer a reason why he decided to receive the ball first or to just say you know it's the first year of this whole new rule most of us learned via adam schefter notification right before overtime started and i know that's the case for like 90 percent of everybody second guessing it man there's no way everybody was familiar with these rules I know the Chiefs said, we've actually gone through this scenario, and that's great by Andy Reid. It was very clear, as Juszczyk said, the Niners didn't know the rule. Otherwise, why else would you receive the ball in that moment? And according to Kyle Shanahan, it was because he wanted the ball third. Yep. And now, I don't know if you remember the game, there was no third possession. This, and I'm a huge Kyle Shanahan guy, huge and I do find it interesting that he is the new Andy Reid. And I hope, like Andy Reid, he can one day change his legacy. This it's so this good. is a immense betrayal yes. from your head coach. Like, that is so bad. The, these two teams were very equal. It was a good game. And it came down, essentially, to someone not knowing the rules. Uh, to answer your question, the worst look is what he's doing right now, which is doubling down. Just come out and acknowledge, hey, I was wrong. I didn't know the rules. Stop making excuses. He was playing for a third possession that didn't exist. The Chiefs told him, hey, there was no third possession. If you scored a touchdown, we were going to score a touchdown, and we were going for two. That's it. Also, just firing this takeoff because I haven't had a chance to talk about one of the greatest Super Bowls ever. Mahomes earlier this season – uh, Mahomes earlier this season complained about the officiating, and he was it was very frustrated. And then he texted his wife in a group chat, "I'm going to make the Super Bowl in Vegas. Watch." It's awesome. The the, uh, the game changed when Kansas City realized, "Oh, we can hold this front four with impunity," because that front four was dominating that game. Mahomes did nothing in that first half, and the tackles just said, "All right, we're going to let it fly." And bear hug these pass rushers from San Francisco. That's Stug- fine. Stugatz, the officials just, let them play. So, but well, no, you it, say, you know, the game you, turned there. You say that's fine. The officials let them play. I have this right. The Chiefs have now played 13 quarters of Super Bowl football without ever being called for a hold. Correct. I mean, we've all seen the clip of Bosa being bear hugged on on a hugely important play. Chase Young was maybe on his way to an MVP performance, and we didn't see much of that in the second half. And it's because the adjustment that was made by Kansas City was, okay, these officials are going to let us play. We can do whatever we want. And by the way, those Kansas City tackles have been getting away with so much all season long. So that's why I came down so hard when Patrick Mahomes decided to be a baby about officiating. He gets the benefit of the doubt so often. A couple of other things, because, Jessica, you thought interesting the explanation as well. You thought that uh, Shanahan made it worse yesterday. 
I think so. I think he should have just lied. Take a leaf out of Stugatz's personal <laughs> record book. Just lie. Just be like, we talked about every scenario, and this was the one that we thought would work. It didn't work, but we, we discussed it a lot and yeah. and we we thought long and hard about it i i thought i specifically pulled huge check aside and i ran down every scenario with him so i don't know what he's talking i about. also told him to play dumb after the game <laughs> this was all part of my master play it didn't work but we planned all of this i i understand why stugatz we would go to the end of the game and talk about rules at the end because what he's saying is egregious but if I go to you earlier in the game and I show you all of the things that were happening, hey, can you believe that Debo Samuel can't do anything against McDuffie? Nothing at all. Debo Samuel erased. Right. That It's going to look like San Francisco is doing great things offensively, but if you've held Kittle and Ayuk, and Ayuk's going to leave there unhappy. His whole family's unhappy because he wasn't used in the Super Bowl. And at the end, on the play they needed the most, Stugatz, the play they needed, the third and fourth play where you've got to win and, and eliminate this cr criticism for your coach. Because on third and fourth down, you keep the ball. And the referees, that we have the audio now of the referees saying, you can't give the ball back to Mahomes. On the third and fourth play where Purdy's got to make a play, he's not throwing to Kittle. He's not. McCaffrey's open. McC the play should have gone to McCaffrey. Somebody comes in. McDuff McDuffie comes in unimpeded. And the game, en the game ends right there because you never give the ball back to McDuffie if, if all of a sudden you've got the ball in the game in your hands. Right. You're, you never give the ball back to Mahomes. Sure. And so when you watch the expertise of what you're talking about there, because Mike's not wrong, you got to know the rules. And, and how do you not know the rules? But Purdy had the game won, and in the, where the margins of the football game is won, they're throwing Purdy to Jennings because they've eliminated Ayuk. And everybody on the team. But, Dan, the game's not won. Even if they score, that's the point. It's why he needed to go for it on fourth down. Well, it's why it, you want the ball second so you know exactly what the scenario correct. is. Instead of having three downs, you have four downs to play with there. I think in, in the in the press conferences that have ensued after the, the Super Bowl, uh, Brock Purdy said that there was a missed assignment on that final play. I know you're a big Legereus Sneed guy, but I've seen two videos of McDuffie being out in the open on that vintage Trent Williams off-tackle run where he's just lead blocking, yeah. and Trent McDuffie holds his own against Trent Williams. He was insane. And also, shout-out to Bill Jerome Barnwell, because I sat through a 60-minute live podcast with him where he said the X factor in that game would be the fourth-best linebacker for Kansas City, Leo Chennault. Uh, uh, an off-ball linebacker for them. He was pro football focus's highest graded player in that game. Off-ball linebacker is one of those positions that was all of a sudden devalued by analytics until they realized they had that one wrong in the last two years. That's become the analytical darling position, and he probably was the entire key to that game. Uh, as we talk about all the keys to the game, the keys to the game, after the keys to the game, the game's been played. This is from Neil Payne, Neil Substack. Since 2001, there have been 125 drives in the NFL postseason where it was at least the fourth quarter. There was under a minute left to play, and the team on offense trailed by seven points or fewer at the start. These are your standard clutch moments for a football team, the do-or-die drives that win and lose critical games. Out of those 125 drives, only 40% of them saw the team on offense pull off the magic trick and get the points they needed. Some quarterbacks are pretty good at it, such as Tom Brady, who went 5 for 11, 46%. Or Drew Brees, who went 3-for-6, 50%. Only Patrick Mahomes, though, is 7-for-7, seven seven, or perfect in those dire situations. <laughs> and the refs are on audio saying, don't give Mahomes the ball back. You can't give Mahomes. That one thing we know about the sport is don't give. And I'm wondering if next year Brady's going to be bitter all year calling these games because he's going to be like, don't erase me that fast. Don't, I was the best at that. Don't erase me at being winner guy that quickly. I just did it a couple of years ago. Dan, he has four more Super Bowls to win. Like the notion that Patrick Mahomes, he's had a great six years. Perhaps it's been We're, better than Brady's it's first all, six. But it's already being done. Enough. There's no way that well, Whoever's doing it is stupid. No, I mean, I, do I have this wrong? Do you think Brady's not watching this and listening to everybody? Can you guys slow down on erasing me because you're already saying Mahomes is the best at this? I, I was just playing a couple of years ago. I mean, Brady's career got off to a weird start in that he had this sort of start that Patrick Mahomes, you could say Patrick Mahomes eclipsed that start. And then for Brady's, what should be his prime, he didn't win a Super Bowl. Yeah. 
like we've we've gone through the set that Wes Walker found a way to not win a Super Bowl with with Manning and Brady. He went a really long stretch with other teams going in there and winning the thing. And I think that just expecting Patrick Mahomes to replicate something that we've never seen before is still a bridge too far. Is Brady a compiler? Oh boy. Stop it. What like, are you doing? I'm just I'm Don't just I'm just asking the question. He yeah, he compiled rings. He, he compiled <laughs> rings, but like he played until he was fifty seven or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. And then like also was he ever the best quarterback? In the league, yeah, the yeah. one year he didn't win. Yeah. Well, did he ever win MVP? Is what you're saying? Yeah. Was he, was no, he... but MVP doesn't mean he was the best in the league. Did mm. anyone ever look at Tom Brady and say this is the best quarterback? Because hmm. I don't. Uh, you're not going to do this. I don't today. know. What is he doing, He's got a Dan? point. We did like uh Peyton Manning, Tom yeah. Brady, and oh, then we did Aaron Rodgers, Tom Brady, and then we did I Pat Mahomes, Tom Brady. That, see what I'm saying? I think people called him that when he went two and zero against Patrick Mahomes. If they were wrong. He wasn't the better quarterback. He's a three-time MVP. Yeah, but the the cool thing about Tom Brady is that from his <laughs> skill set, from I, mean, I get the point that he was making. What do because, you do against that? Because Tom know. Brady, even though being the best quarterback of all time and playing in the the greatest era of quarterbacks of all time, was never identified as the most skilled. See, he could be the greatest of all time, but he was never the greatest. You know what he was the greatest at, at the Billy winning. Yeah. Uh, put his rings in a box. Put everybody else's rings in a box. Yeah, we'll see how they shake up. Yeah. More years. But that defense, that's I mean, not, you know, he, he beat defense, Patrick please. Mahomes in Arrowhead as a Patriot. He beat Patrick Mahomes in the Super Bowl as a Buck. I'm mm. asking you guys, COVID year. Do you think that Tom Brady is going to be bitterly calling all of Mahomes' games the rest of the way, <laughs> saying from the booth, going out of his way to look, crush him? He, he's already <laughs> told us the sport is now mediocre. As soon as he retired, he thought ever, now. Will Brady be a hot take artist in old age that just skewers Patrick Mahomes and says, you're not as good as me, kid? Do it in Carolina. If, if you go by PFF rankings between 2010 and 2020, he was the highest rated quarterback three times. Uh, Tom Brady was. Right. He's well, great. The yeah, one he year wasn't seven times, though. So if he's I mean, 30%, I mean, that's an F. Mm hmm. Um, Stugatz, I wanted to talk about what happened last night with the Miami Heat and the Bucks because um, what's happening with Milwaukee is I, is funny. I mean, Doc Rivers has now returned heroically. They had a coup, and now they're terrible. And the Heat go in there and win by thirty. And without Jimmy Butler, without Jimmy Butler. Well, this is another conversation. Or this a point guard. Look. Yeah, <laughs> no point guard, no Jimmy Butler. All those Damian Lillard assets look pretty good. So, in one game, it's a one-game sample, but I now have three seasons of sample on what I'm about to say, and I can't believe that Duncan Robinson is this dude. But evidently, Duncan Robinson helps in a way that's unusual in the way that he spaces the floor and the big three of Hero and Butler and Bam, when they're together, Stugatz, they're really mediocre. But when one of them's out, they go to the finals a couple of times. <laughs> and, and You it, have to sit one of the three each night. I mean. Uh, well, it's, some of them are hurt often. And when they get hurt, the Heat play better. And it's a little <laughs> bit strange. And Duncan Robinson is now a key piece. And I want to play some video. And the audio is not great on this. But I want, I want you to watch some trash talk here between Duncan Robinson and Jalen Brown. Because Duncan Robinson, Stugatz, has become somebody who has, in, in front of all of us, has improved in a way that's kind of crazy. He, is, he has now got a multifaceted game, and he doesn't mind going at it with Jalen Brown. And I didn't think I didn't think a couple of – a bubble ago when Duncan Robinson was awed to be playing with LeBron James, I didn't think he had this in him. Yeah. 
You're not like that. I will tell the audio audi- uh, audience. If you're listening only. on the podcast, you wouldn't believe what he yeah, said. Uh, <laughs> it, it was. You can imagine how good it was. as sound that you weren't reading. But the end of that, after 30 seconds, was uh, the dismount where Duncan Robinson said to Jalen Brown at at fighting time, "You're not that guy." <laughs> you're not like that. <laughs> what? Coming from Duncan. Is that, a ta- is that a takes one to no one type of thing? It's like, hey, I'm at that you're not that guy uh, guy pal meeting. We have it every quarter, and I see you there. Right. We're at the same you're not that guy pal meeting. I don't want to fight. I know you don't want to fight. We don't want to fight. I mean, <laughs> Dan, you know what's happening right now, though? Duncan is getting a little bit of that dog in him. Oh, we're slowly, We're slowly getting to a place where that dog is coming out. Uh, can we have the broader conversation of how it is that they're better when one of the guys is out? You want to dig deep on the his you dog is dog coming dogs. out situation? <laughs> no dog. Huh? Yeah, no I, more I, to that bone. Dog more dogs. Race, don't, don't we all want more dogs on the heat? Right? Is that dog that bone? People, this is a moment of reflection for Jalen Brown. You just got told by Duncan Robinson you're not that guy, pal. Yeah. <laughs> In Black History Month. <laughs> oh, come on. <laughs> That, in what, in what is, February, why, why Duncan you, Robinson told you, you're not that guy, pal. When you're not that yeah. guy, you're not that guy. What are we no doing matter here? what month it is. Mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, look at this. A meeting of two guys that are not that guy. <laughs> <laughs> Scary Terry Hurt. Yes. Oh, yeah. Got to sack these wins before he comes back. <laughs> Ooh, real difficulty navigating that. A slalom course. Uh, Billy, I don't know how you feel because you keep your fandom well concealed. And so uh, I think that the last couple of days, as an economics gut punch, that the Marlins losing Jorge Soler. I, I know I know nobody cares about baseball. Allegedly, I care about baseball. And I've been heartbroken. Just the Rays. Pitchers and catchers today, Dan. P's and C's. Yeah. 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 Great yeah. day. We're opening, back. Opening yeah. day at the light on Friday. Oh, hey. Oh, wow. New Jersey okay. Institute of Technology. It's a bad day to be injured. <laughs> Gotta get a shake. And IT? I don't know if you care about players anymore that way, Billy, but once upon a time, Soler hitting 35 homers, being on the cheap, you can keep him. He wants to stay here. You don't have to give him that much, and then the Giants swoop in and give him three years, $40 million, and the Marlins can't play the money game with the Braves and the Dodgers or anybody or the Phillies or the Mets or anybody. They'll lose Soler, even a guy who wants to be here, and I'm wondering if it hurts or if you just shrug your shoulders and say, well, we're going to lose the division to the Braves for 10 years anyway, so what difference does it make? Yeah, I mean, closer to that. I mean, not that he wasn't the missing piece that was going to have them win the NL East, so, you know. It kind of felt like he wasn't going to be coming back regardless. It was just a matter of time before he went somewhere. But so. then don't you have to feel like you're doomed to an eternity of we're not going to compete? I've I can felt care. like that since 1993. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, that's always been my feeling. <laughs> I'm used to this. I mean, Bell and Berger are coming back. so And they, they fixed the black uniforms. Yeah, white I mean, font now. Yeah, but then it's Nike ruined the uniforms, but at least the, the black on black is gone. Some white font on the black unis. Uh, you Friday know, blues. Some, exactly right, some blue ones. When you're a Marlins fan, Dan, you just take the small victories. I mean, that's it. Playoff <laughs> team last season. Yeah, that was good. <laughs> right. It's good now, but there's new management. <laughs> Can we, we have a GM now and, uh, you know. Didn't get the message that we have to be signing players, but <laughs> but you have one. Well, we have one exactly yeah. right. We're Easing into the position. P's and C's. I imagine when they show up on the field today and they realize there's no one there because we didn't yeah. sign anyone, they'll realize, <laughs> oh, oh, we got to sign people, and then they'll fill out the roster. So I'm not too worried at the moment. They're the only team without pitchers and catchers reporting. <laughs> Maybe an empty field when they get there. <laughs> it won't be. The ball. Where, are where, where are our pitchers and where are our catchers? <laughs> Just a couple of equipment guys and somebody sprinkling the field. In a fungo. <laughs> That's what remains of our baseball team. While while Otani is paid seven hundred million dollars somewhere else. It's a lot of money. <laughs> too much. Way too much. <laughs> You're not mad at cheater. Jeter's gone. What do I have to say? Man, I hold grudges for? It was a grift. It was all a grift. <laughs> you didn't know that, do? Dan, from the moment he said, I'm paying myself $5 million until I recoup my investment? <laughs> you didn't know I, it was a grift? I was happy at the time. I thought that he was getting Samson out of my life, but apparently he's coming up next. <laughs> He is. We got to talk to him about those uniforms. Didn't Nike just get embarrassed? Nike is uh, really getting hit with it on social media because they've changed 
the design on these uniforms and Major League Baseball authentic uniforms now look cheap and the players are kind of really upset about it. Everyone's upset about this and I'm, I, it, it looks like Nike may have to do a recall. <laughs> there is business stuff to talk about with Samson. We're going to do it next.
David Sampson was not with us in Vegas. I have not talked to him. I'm guessing he's not terribly happy about all of that. I should say, and I don't think Metal Ark did a very good job of celebrating, that David Sampson was our biggest award winner last year. His podcasts were voted best of. Uh, his singular podcast, he doesn't have multiple podcasts, hmm. won best of in two categories, best baseball podcast and best sports business podcast. So congratulations, David. I'm sorry that Metal Ark has failed to celebrate you in the way that it should. <laughs> no, I felt great watching all of your live shows and watching everyone having the best time. I especially enjoyed watching Juju and Lucy play craps with Chris, knowing that that's my thing. I think I would not have added anything to your time other than amazing connections, having been going to Vegas for over 30 years. Uh, well, yes, you are a bit of a celebrity in Vegas, are you not? You're somebody who can, you do have all the contacts in Vegas, do you not? I'm, I wouldn't say celebrity. I would say I just have access and I have the ability to do a lot of fun stuff with a lot of fun people, with people who I enjoy working with and spending time with. And it was a, quite a bit of, uh, of FOMO in that you guys absolutely nailed it. I'm thrilled, but I will tell you that I can certainly have been additive to what you were doing. Uh, is anyone in particular the source of your ire? Hmm. Yeah, it, you're in charge. It was obviously your decision to not have me there. It's not as though Metal Art didn't spend money. I would have covered my own expenses, by the way, only in that I generally stay complimentary and the plane ticket it wasn't an issue, but it wasn't even offered as a possibility. And given the amount of investment you made, I wasn't asking to be on your show the whole time, but maybe as a guest for 12 minutes, maybe I just would have gone to a team dinner or enjoyed listening to Greg and Jeremy and the Hee Haw 7. It would have been fantastic, huh. but I, I'm over it. It's done. What's it, done? What's uh, done is done. Mm -hmm. uh, it doesn't seem like you're over it no. though, and it seems yeah. like there's a whole lot of Getting ice. Angrier. There's a yeah. whole lot of ice in the other room, as far as I can tell, and it seems like it's just my fault. Well, I, I just would say that I've been sitting here since nine o'clock, so I'll start with that, and uh, <laughs> I'm good. Everything's fine. Ready to go. What, what do you want to talk about today, Ben? <laughs> Nothing personal is the award-winning podcast. Uh, the thing that I want to talk about, among many others, is uh, what you made of the Super Bowl audience. The idea that it would be the highest-rated television show ever. That there would $50 million of bonus advertising from the game just going into uh, overtime. The business of the Super Bowl. What were the most interesting parts of it to you? Well, what a risk by having the Super Bowl in Vegas to start with. And what I was concerned, and you heard Joe Buck talk about it, Boomer Esiason mentioned it, just the possibility of something bad happening because Vegas is a place that, of extremes where there's greatness and there's absolute, the stuff that nightmares come from. And I would say the NFL came pretty much unscathed. There was one early arrest by a Raiders player, but you can dismiss that. He was in the parking in the valet DUI and he lives there or he plays there. But in terms of the actual Super Bowl, nothing, there were no you know perp walks, nothing like that. That was a positive. Then of course you had the game and what Paramount did, CBS had the game where they announced the $123 million. Two days later, just yesterday, they announced a bunch of layoffs. And I think that what's important to note is the number of people who watch the game doesn't correlate to earnings per share or to an increase in the stock price of a merged company. And at the end of the day, it is just business. The timing people are questioning but you would never fire people before Vegas because they have work to do. Now's the time that you would let people go. It's obviously unfortunate, but with consolidation, with merging comes layoffs, and it has nothing to do with how many people watch the Super Bowl at all. They could pay their CEO less. They could do that too. So that is the, so they yes, could. that is true. And Metal Art could pay you less and then you could give raises to everybody. I mean, they but do. at the end of the day, that's not how it works in the real world. It reminds me of the Jack Nicholson line in broadcast news. All these layoffs, if you just take a pay cut and she gets ushered away, like removed from the scene, because that's not how it works. You don't have anchors or owners or the top talents take less. The people who suffer are the middle class and the lower class. And that happens not just on TV or off TV. It happens in every business, no matter what products you're making. David, have you ever had a manager ever at any point in your, uh, your career in Major League Baseball that didn't know the rules that you were paying him to know? 
Are you talking about Kyle Shanahan not knowing the overtime rules? Yes. And then saying, no, no, we actually went through it with the analytics department and we wanted the ball first. Yep. Because that's, that's the story he's sticking with. Mm -hmm. And I believe that. There is no scenario under which Kyle Shanahan did not know the overtime rules. We've had players not know rules. We've had players not know signs. And what you do is you just tell the player what the signs are when he's on base. But I've never had a manager not know a rule except when something strange can happen during a game, and that's not a game going to extra innings or overtime. We had a rule book in the suite with the GM. We would have a rule book, and when we saw something happen, we'd go down to the clubhouse, and we would get in contact with the manager when there was a dispute or a question about a rule. But something as ordinary as a postseason overtime game, no excuse for not knowing, and they did. The second thing, when a rule change like that happens, like in baseball, you get a separate memo before the season starts of all of the new rule changes, and you post that in the clubhouse. It doesn't matter if the players read it or not, but the manager has a laminated copy of it on his desk at all times, and we have one in the dugout. So like with challenges, Remember when the challenge started and you didn't know what's challengeable, what's not? More well, memos. Right More there. memos is what we need. That's what we need. More it's, memos. More well, laminated it's just memos. An explanation. I mean, there's no way that Shanahan didn't know the rules. They made a decision <sighs> it didn't work. Yeah. And what what Jessica and Stu said is exactly right in this first segment that I wasn't on. It's that all he had to do was come out and say that's exactly what we intended to do but we gave up a touchdown and we would have had a third possession if we had held them to a field goal. It didn't work out. What do you think that should have been? What do you think the reason is for not going over the rules with its team? Because while he's saying on one side of his mouth that he went through, went through that scenario with his analytics department, he admitted Mm -hmm. that he didn't talk to uh, the players about this rule change. And you had players that were on that field, totally uh, oblivious to it. I've never gone over rules with players. We never do. We read them the gambling rule before the season starts because we're told to by the CBA and by baseball. We don't go over what plays are challengeable or what aren't. That's why in baseball you see players challenge or you see them go like this and they don't know how many challenges you have left or when or what can be challenged. As far as San Francisco is concerned, here's the rule you need to know. Don't give up touchdowns. That's it. That's all you need to tell your defense. Okay. I wish we'd just known. It's such a simple to piece. Patrick Mahomes. It's such right. a simple piece of coaching. Do I have this right? Do you believe, have you said on nothing personal that you believe that Travis Kelsey is a menace who needs anger management? Yeah, I did a whole segment. I was, I would have, and, and this is not going to be popular. First of all, I was upset with CBS, and, and, I, and I can say this even though I do work for them. They showed Kelsey and Reed, and then they never mentioned it again and I never saw a camera. Did Reed go talk to Kelsey? And I didn't remember, did Kelsey sit out a series? What were the ramifications of what Kelsey did to Reed during that game? Because they both covered it up after they won the game, I'll tell you that, say, no, all's great in love and war, I love him, he loves me. That sort of behavior is unacceptable, and it certainly gives you an eye into that level of anger. Now, is it caused by over-caffeination? being over caffeinated before a game are people sort of like the incredible hulk during a football game in order to psych themselves up whatever no excuse for what he did but i believe that cbs and i believe that the chiefs gave him an out because of travis kelsey because of taylor swift and they didn't want to ruffle any feathers and i would have benched him I would have had oh, him come gone on. for one <laughs> David, get come out of here. Come on. Come on. Are you serious? Come David. on. If a baseball player attacks a manager physically during a game, you don't think he's taken out of the game? I do think race is playing a factor here because I remember the weeks of shows people did when Odell Beckham Jr. kicked a field goal net, and this is the second time Travis Kelsey has thrown a helmet. This is the first time he's bumped his quarterback, and I do think if that were, say, Kadarius Toney, it'd be processed way differently by everybody. This is what A.J. Brown said as well, uh, but uh, you're not – you're saying it's being well undercovered is what you're saying. You're saying uh, – can you imagine the story if – if Reed had benched him and they'd lost the Super Bowl, are you out of your mind, David? Uh, no, I'm not out of my mind because you've got a team of 50 players who are watching what Travis Kelsey did and saying, oh, I guess he can do that. 
you don't want to treat. It's not as though Kelsey's not being treated differently already with all the ridiculousness around Taylor Swift. But, David, they're also watching Kelsey on the field perform, and they're saying, oh, I can't do that. And so there is a sliding scale to this where, David, I'm going to take you back to 2003, okay? If Derek Lee punches Jack McKean in the face, he's not benching him. But if Mordecai does, he's probably getting benched. You're wrong. We did it to Pudge. We did it to Pudge. We benched Pudge for being disrespectful to his teammates and to Jack McKeon. We benched him. Go back and look at the game by game. In the Super Bowl? In the World Series? No, he didn't do it in the World Series. But if he had done it in the World Series, David, if he had done it in the World Series, he's not getting benched. I would have taken him out of the game. If he attacked Jack McKeon, I would have taken him out of the game, played Redmond, and then let Pudge play the next game. Is it worth losing a championship to prove a point to discipline a player, David? Yes. And I, and by the way, I don't believe they would have lost the championship by benching Kelsey for a series. And maybe they did. What just Except happened we, there? We, what just happened? I mean, there's a, quite the drop-off between Travis Kelsey and Noah Gray. There is, David. Oh, I, I, did something happen? Did no. we lose service? It's, uh, well, I, you just, I think I left you speechless. <laughs> You're sacrificing a championship to By make a larger point. We're, we're yes. mystified. I'm not we're mo- sacrificing a championship. You're, you're not framing it right. Uh, if Kelsey sits for a series, they don't necessarily lose that game. Oh, so you're just sitting him a series. Okay. I, I would have sat him for a series, and maybe they did. <laughs> oh. Okay. I should have benched him for the game. What he did is inexcusable, and no one talks about it because no one wants to upset Taylor. It's a joke. You think that's the reason no <laughs> one's talking about it, that we're afraid of t- upsetting Taylor Swift? I'm a, I'm a, you're not talking about it because you don't want to be on the unpopular side of any issues like this. No, what, 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 you, you don't realize yeah, that there's Dan, a team. You're afraid what of the big issues. What if someone in your container attacked you, Dan? <laughs> what if someone attacked you right now? You're not going to put them in the quote-unquote real penalty box? Give me a break. Um, I, all right, I'm going to I am going to imagine Josh I'm, I'm going to show in the next segment what it would look like if McKeon was in a fight before the game. I am going to apologize about 30 minutes too late to the audio only audience for that 30 <laughs> seconds of Jalen Brown, Duncan Robinson trash talk that didn't sound like anything. <laughs> because there was no sound. Because yeah. it was mostly subtitles. Yeah. Uh, and in so doing, I may lose a portion of the audio audience again here as I show again for the second day one of my favorite videos, Pedro Martinez fighting with Don Zimmer. And Don Zimmer rolls out out forehead first uh, to uh, fight with Pedro. Pedro got into a lot of controversy where Mike says that race is involved because uh, that Dominican young man threw him down to the floor by his ears. The lovable, bald Don Zimmer, and now Stugatz has Jack McKeon in a fight because (laughs) David Sampson, I I want to address this very quickly with you, David. Uh, You are saying flatly, you're not saying you would, but you're saying some sort of discipline to show who's in charge, but not enough discipline to actually cost myself the game. That's the tightrope that I'm willing to walk. Hmm. Okay, but you walked your position back some because benching him for the game would be even more badass and show show who's in charge all the more, but would be even dumber than having a coach not know the rules in a Super Bowl. 
you said it during a Super Bowl or a World Series game. For a regular season game, it's not even a question. If Kelsey does that, and I don't mean throwing of the helmet. I'm talking about physically touching the coach. He's gone for the game at least. But, David, going back to your 03 team that won the World Series, if Beckett during the World Series touches Jack McKeon, he's not coming out. You're not taking him out. Jack's not taking him out. Brad Penny, different story. You would skip a start for Penny with a smile on your face. <laughs> Wait, okay? whoa, Penny was good in 03. Well, Bo, Penny was good. He was really good, for those of you who may not remember. So the answer is you have to. We had conversations like this because we had to have it about Hanley Ramirez, who was really a problem for us in the clubhouse, and we had to figure out what to do with him. And one of the things we did was, was bench him. And one of the things we did with Pudge when he disappeared during 03, and then he reappeared, Jack said to us, and we agreed, I'm not playing him. And Jeffrey said, you've got to play him. We want to win these games. And Jack said, if you really want to win as a team, you've got to show the rest of the team that you're not going to let the superstar dictate the terms. Travis Kelsey, is he a first ballot Hall of Famer? Maybe. Yes. But he yes. is way more... If you don't think that he's don't, more don't, in the news... Don't diminish, don't diminish Kelsey's credentials. First here. ballot Hall of Famer. So first ballot Hall of Famer, do you agree that he is more in the spotlight because of his relationship right now? Yeah. Yeah, naturally. Yes. Okay. Therefore, there is a different standard you're putting on what happened during that Super Bowl because it was the Super Bowl and because it was Travis Kelsey. And Mike's not wrong. If that had been a different player, if that had been a black player who had done that, and, the, and there had been some sort of ramification for that, we're having a totally different discussion. And I would like to have the discussion based on how you don't lose your clubhouse. And again, CBS didn't show us. Do we know for sure that Travis Kelsey didn't sit for a series? I don't know the answer to that. I feel like it would have been pointed out, but um, either way. Nothing was pointed out. It was left. It was left. Nothing was said. Yeah, that's a that's a kind of capital that uh, Travis Kelsey has bought with people because of his career. I want to switch gears uh, quickly because I, I want to get your opinion on whether or not Nike's going to have to do a uniform recall because players are really upset that the customizable options on pants are gone and uh, consumers, the people that love to buy MLB merchandise, if you've seen the new uniforms, and we'll throw some. Uh, some comparisons between last year's on the left and this year's on the right. These new MLB uniforms look really cheap, really cheap. And I think the, the reaction to this has been so toxic that we might actually see uniforms being pulled this year. David, what is your take on uh, the, the new uniform controversy? So you're catching me a little bit and we're live. So I think I'm right, but someone can do a fact check with the 40 people working there. Fanatics does the uniforms. Fanatics says I licensed I, I, the Nike swoosh to put on them. Correct, and uh, so every, I don't believe look, 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 they're manufactured by they, Nike. They, so everybody wanted to take the opportunity to jump down Fanatics' throat because Fanatics is a very polarizing entity. But the specs were provided by Nike. Darren Ravel is done reporting on this. Even a, a, a Twitter account by the name of Fanatics Suck, which exists because they want to <laughs> slam dunk every day. Uh, of making fun of fanatics, they put the blame over on Nike because Nike provides these specs, and it doesn't matter who manufactures it, they're just following the lead from Nike. Yes, they are licensing the swoosh, but the design, everything, was provided by Nike. So this is all done over a year in advance. It all gets approved, it all gets manufactured, and the specs get given to the licensees who then make the uniforms. There is zero chance that all the uniforms will be pulled and new uniforms will be made and then sent to all the teams prior to the regular season. These will be the uniforms. I draw your attention to when the Marlins switch uniforms, everyone complains. When every team switches uniforms, the majority of people are negative and you just get through it. So I don't think there will be any change because what do you do with all these uniforms? MLB is not going to eat it. Fanatics is not going to eat it, yeah. and so you're left with this inventory, and they're not going to write it off. I hear you, although I feel pretty strongly now that I should put some action on these uniforms being recalled because of uh, your passion here. But the players are coming out and saying these are bad. It's one thing if— No one if, cares. If something—it doesn't carry any additional weight if the players are complaining about it? No. Would you agree Zero. that it looks terrible? I would agree that I couldn't read the names on the back of the Marlins uniforms, but those got approved by everybody. 
and now they're changed. I understand from your first segment, I hadn't seen them, but that's outstanding that they're now changed. Do I think that they look worse this year? I personally do, but a big part of the uniforms, I haven't felt them yet. And the players are very concerned about how they feel, what sort of the wicking is, and then sizing. Because some players, when we go through sizing with new players, this is a funny little story if you have a minute. We spend time with players who we acquire, figuring out what size they like. Do they like their pants to be tight? Like Stanton always would have special issued undershirts right. that he would do his interviews in that were so tight that he that he would wear my size. Right, but one of the chief complaints here, you? David, I mean, one of the chief complaints here is that those customizable options aren't afforded to players now. So we, you, you, they are because what you do is we have seam seamsters, seam stru, seams. Um, Whoa, the people who that was a glitch. Did you want to say it. seamstress and just make it? You got it. Yeah, it's a real easy glitch in yeah. the system there. Yeah, it's okay. <laughs> seamstresses? Yes, there I got you it. go. We have to play that back. <laughs> are seamstresses <laughs> only women? Because ours are men. So I didn't know whether it was a seamster. Uh, anyway. Is it a tailor? Yeah. You can say kit man. <laughs> it is a kit man. Huh. We have a bunch of people in the clubhouse who are altering uniforms all the time. So I'm not worried about players not having the size they want. You don't care at all what the players think about anything in this scenario. Like the players about uniforms, no. The players uniform. Well, but I mean, this is deeply personal though, David. They're they're playing for eight hours a day. They're in clothing. They'd like it to be something. They they collectively bargain everything with you. It needs to look decent. It can't look cheap. Like if if major if the players union wants something like this to look better, if the complaints are loud enough, you don't get to just be right on this. They'll wear what we tell them to wear. They will, but what a dream. If there's a negotiation where the players want to collectively bargain that they've got a say over the uniforms and they're willing to give up something financial for that, then I guarantee you players will have a say over what uniforms look it's like. It's not without but precedent. Not it's not without happen. precedent in other sports with the unions not strong enough. Remember, they change basketballs, and you might want to say, okay, well, that's what they play the sport with. So you can understand that. But remember, players rebelled against the sleeves that Adidas uh, wa was creating for basketball. LeBron went as far as to tear sleeves off of his uniform, and they stopped manufacturing those. It did take some time. What are you shaking your head about, Samson? I'm laughing because, yes, there are moments that players like to take stands on certain things. We've had players take stands on what they wear under the uniform because that is also a rule. We tell the players what they can wear underneath and what can be shown. And now there's going to be rules, I'm sure, about having batting gloves hanging out of your back pocket because, God forbid, that ever gets tagged. But I don't have never seen a baseball player take a stand like a LeBron James. I, I don't even know who, which baseball player – would have that type of ability. It's not Judge, it's not Trout, it's not anybody who would have that level of power. It's not Max Scherzer. I can't think of anybody. Bryce Harper? Who would... no, no, absolutely not. Hmm. No client so of Scott Boris would get anything done with Major League Baseball. <laughs> All right, uh, again with Scott Boris, I want, they, here are your options, because we've only got three minutes left, and I know I could get you going on Boris. He's got a bunch of clients who are still available as spring training begins. You love to hate on Boris. Is there anyone you hate more, and is it because he's better at business than you are? No, it's because he screwed Jose Fernandez's family. I respected him when I negotiated against him because he got, he got an owner to always give in. And he generally always got his players what they wanted. But when he crocodile teared at Jose's funeral, that was it. I would never, there is no coming back from that. There's no coming back from not properly being in touch or taking care of the family ever since and just walking away from them. There's no coming back. And I don't, I'm not a grudge holder. I don't have this level of visceral anger toward anyone else in my life as I do for him because I know him well enough and I know what he did and I know exactly what is happening in the world of Jose's family and I can't forgive it. I just won't. What if he were to say to you, hey, David, it's nothing personal? I, I'd say thanks for watching the show, which I know he has his people watch and listen to every show and that makes me smile. Uh, let's play the clip for David here on him trying to figure out <laughs> whether he should say seamstress or something else is we have seam seamsters seam strut seams um whoa the <laughs> <laughs> it's so great I finally it wasn't me 
<laughs> That's the world we live in where I need to be worried about not upsetting anyone with the word seamstress. Uh, you didn't need to worry about that, but you did. Play it again in its face. You didn't it was, need to worry. We have wor- seam, seamsters. Seamstress. Seams. Um, Whoa. People- <laughs> Why did you stop complaining about the world you live in and just say it right? Because did you know that there's no male version of seamstress? Well, I didn't know the rules of overtime either, but it didn't make me stop criticizing Kyle Shanahan. Not at the Shanahan. (laughs) He knew the rules. He did not. 30 seconds or less. What are you reviewing? Oh, 30 seconds for Society of the (laughs) Snow. And whether or not you All right, no. You're You're halfway done with it, Dave. It's really good. Hold on. Hold on. Just stop right there. Do your review, and Juju will put it out on social by itself because you don't want to be limited. (laughs) Limited to 30 seconds. Uh, Nothing personal is the podcast. If you want 50 daily minutes, uh, they are rocket-fueled with David Sampson every uh, every morning. Thank you, David. Take care. It's for you. We have seam seamsters. Seam stress. Seams. Um, Whoa.